we're in Esther 6 this morning, and there's a lot of really great stuff in here uh, that I'm excited to share with you all. As we open Esther 6 this morning, we find ourselves at the turning point uh, in the story of Esther. If you remember, or if you're just joining us this morning, last week Esther 5, in Esther 5, Casey, which he did a fantastic job. I, I know y'all were excited to see him again, and uh, it's always great to have him here. Um, he did a great job walking us through Esther 5. But Casey uh, walked us through how Esther went to the king, uh, King Xerxes or King uh, Ahasuerus, um, and to plead her case for her people. And because Haman, uh, uh, because Haman, a Persian official, had convinced Xerxes to put out a decree for the annihilation of the Jews after Mordecai, Esther's cousin, did not bow down to him. Last week we saw that Esther went to the king uh, at risk of her own life because if you remember in Esther 4, we learned that to go to the king, having not been summoned, was almost certain death unless the king extended the scepter out to them. So Esther went because uh, she and her people were in danger. Um, and the king showed her favor, and, and he asked her what was her request. And, Esther, uh, when, when he, and whatever it was to be, it would be given to her, right? And to our surprise, to the reader's surprise, to our surprise, um, instead of bringing up the decree to the king right then and there, she instead invites him and Haman to a banquet, right? Um, we're, we're not sure the reasoning there, uh, but it's kind of a, okay, I thought you were going to go talk to him about this, and you're inviting him to, to dinner, um, and if you're, like, if you're like me, you're probably wondering why she did that. Why, why not just ask the king then and there? Uh, well, that's because she's not like me. She's not, she's not uh, impatient sometimes. Uh, and uh, after all he said and whatever, whatever she, she wanted to uh, be given to her, Esther had faith in God and knew the scriptures and knew that she needed to give time to let God work. Because if they were going to be saved, it was going to be by God. Reading through this, it reminds me of, of a psalm, Psalm 127. The first two verses there says, Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. And it is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil. For he gives to his beloved sleep. And so she throws this banquet and invites him and Haman to it. And at the end of, bank, uh, at the, end of the banquet, the king asked, again asks her, what is her request? And he says, even up to half of his kingdom. But Esther again asks him to come to another banquet the next day. Instead of talking to him, about the issue, he sa she says, I'm going to be patient, and I know the Lord works when I'm not working. I know that the anxious toil, I don't need to anxiously toil over something. I need to allow God time to work. And so she invites him to a banquet the next day. Um, she was trusting in God's work. And meanwhile, Haman leaves the first party there's a, a, a dichotomy here. Esther, Esther is trusting and being patient with the Lord, right? Trusting that the Lord work. And then Haman, what does he do when he leaves the party? He goes and talks to his friends and his wife about what is happening. And his, his wife and friends convince him that it is a good thing that he should go build gallows to go hang Mordecai on the next day. And so this, man, this just shows you that you need to be careful whose advice you're taking, right? Proverbs 12, uh, 15 says, the way of the fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man listens to advice. Okay, that's great, but whose advice are you looking for? And I think you can give, we can get some uh, insight from that in James three seventeen, where it says, but the wisdom from uh, above is first pure, then peaceable, then gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good friends, good, good fruits, friends. I don't know what that word that is. Um, good fruits, impartial and sincere. 
I don't think murdering somebody on gallows qualifies for wisdom from above, right? And so if you're, if you're going to get advice from your friends or, or from your family and, and, and their advice is not fitting into this category, man, maybe you shouldn't be taking their advice. Um, so James 3, 17 kind of gives us a good uh, uh, litmus test, if you would, on, on what advice we should be taking. But Haman did not do this, and he listened to some bad advice from his friends and his wife. And this is where we find ourselves this morning in Esther 6, the turning point of the book. Esther 6, 1 through 3. I'm just going to read it for us real fast. On that night, the king could not sleep, and he gave orders to bring the book of memorable deeds, the chronicles, and they were read before the king. And it was found written how Mordecai had told about uh, Bigthania and Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs who guarded the threshold and who had sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. And the king said, what honor and distinction has been bestowed on Mordecai for this? And the king's young men who attended him said, nothing has been done for him. Now, there's a lot in this, but I want us to bring, I want to bring atten- your attention to the first couple of words of the chapter because they are some of the most important words in the entire book of Esther. Because they, they point to our first point this morning, that God in his providence saves. Remember in, in Psalm 127, at the end of verse 2, it says, For he gives to his beloved sleep. And in Mark 4, 26 through 27, Jesus expands our understanding of this. It is while we sleep, when we take our hand off, when we put our anxiety down at the feet of God, that is when God works. He brings us rest and he moves. But instead, the picture here for Xerxes is that there is no sleep. In the Hebrew, that first phrase, on the night the king could not sleep, it's only four words. And the third word is nededa. And that literally, if you look at that word, the word literally means to flee or to run away or to flutter away on wings. And so we see that the sleep, as we read this, we see that the sleep is literally fleeing from Xerxes, literally fleeing, running away from the king. Like there is something behind this lack of sleep, like he is he is chasing, trying to go to sleep. And we know that because he brought out the chronicles. I mean, if, if you're a king and you're wanting to go to sleep, have somebody read you a government document, yeah. right? I mean, he is literally chasing after sleep, and, and sleep is literally fleeing from him. And if you've ever experienced insomnia, it is not fun. And I think there's two things uh, primarily that, that could be causing his sleeplessness. First, the banquet with Esther and her odd request. When, you, when you've known somebody for a while, and, and the king and Esther had been married for a while, uh, we don't know if their relationship was close or not, but he clearly cared for her in the way he did. When you've known somebody for a while, you can tell when something's wrong. If you've been, been married, you know your spouse, hopefully, enough that if she's upset or if there's something wrong, you, you just know it, Right? There's an inherent, like, I know there's something wrong. Um, And if you're like me, sometimes you're a little bit too, like, tell me what it is. I want to know. I want to know. I know. (laughs) Kelly's like, give me time. I'm like, let's, let's face this conflict. I want to, I want to get it over it. Right. Um, Luckily in, in marriage, we've learned to figure that out, but you know, and you can tell when something's wrong if you've known somebody for a while. And there's no evidence that, that Esther also had ever come to the king before with ever, out, without out being asked. So it's a very odd thing that she would go to the king, risking her life to see the king. And so uh, just to invite him to dinner, right? That's a, a very odd thing. And it probably was like, okay, there's something going on here in the king. He's mine. And, and then when he, when he asks her again at the end of the banquet, she's like, hey, come tomorrow. I want to make a banquet for you tomorrow. Doesn't, doesn't answer his question, right? So it's, it's kind of like that. Have you ever had 
where somebody calls you up or, or asks you and says, hey, maybe it's your boss. It's like, hey, come in Monday morning, 7 a.m. I've got a, I've got a, I want to talk to you about something. And they tell you that Friday and then all weekend, you've got that anxiety in there. It's like, am I getting fired? What did I do? And then you walk into the meeting and it's like, hey, just so you know, the big boys are coming in next week and we got to get things. And it has nothing to do with you, but you got all that anxiety. It's, it's like that, right? Where you can't sleep because you have no idea what that meeting is going to be about. So that's a good possibility on why he couldn't sleep. The other possibility is that God is literally causing sleep to flee from him. Or it could be a mixture of both, because the theme through Esther we have seen is how God has used ordinary events, insignificant events, to his advantage, right? And so he, he could be using this turmoil that Esther is putting anxiety that Esther is putting him through as, as a way to, to keep him from sleeping so that he might be read the Chronicles and see that Mordecai had never been honored. The authors of the Septuagint, uh, which is the great translation of the Old Testament, they uh, believed this to be the case, that, that God was literally causing sleep to flee from him. And so if you read the, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the Septuagint, it's, translu- it's translated literally as the Lord took sleep from the king that night. The translators were, were trying to say the quiet pa- part out loud, that the Lord was at work or- orchestrating the events of the evening. And so uh, Xerxes can't sleep, and he brings in the chronicles to be read. And we know that the kings liked to chronicle everything. It's well documented in history that this is a, this is a thing they did. Um, and they also did it so they could keep a record of, of how they rewarded people. And so when he read about Mordecai and how he had not and then asked, how did I reward him? And they said, you haven't rewarded him. Honestly, that was a stain on Xerxes because kings at the time, they prided themselves in how they rewarded their people. It was the reason why is because it ensured their continued support and service. It was a way they they continued to win the support and service of their subjects. They wanted to show people, hey, this is what you get for, for doing good service to the king. So strive for this. And that's why it was usually done as soon as possible, unlike this, where Mordecai is five years later, and it has still not been done. Now, why does this section matter so much to the story? Why is this the turning point? Why, why do I say that the phrase that, that the phrase that he couldn't sleep is the turning point of the story? Because the sleepless night that Xerxes experienced sets off a chain of events, a chain of reversals that will change everything. And it's done in a very non-dramatic way. Right? If, if, if I was the author, you would expect, and, and in fact, in, in uh, when you're reading stories and stuff, you would expect that uh, a dramatic showdown between Esther and Haman to be the turning point of the story. But instead, we see that the turning point of the story is a sleepless night that allows the king to realize, recognize that Mordecai saved his life and he needs to honor him. And by making the pivot point or the turning point of the story here, the author is taking the focus away from human action and reinforcing the message that no one in the story, not even the most powerful person in the empire, is in control of what is about to happen. As I was reading through a commentary, I I thought this was a really good point that it made. It says, in spite of having all the power of the Persian Empire at his disposal, 
Haman's carefully laid out plans were turned against him simply because the king had a sleepless night. The author is suggesting that beneath the surface of human decisions and actions is an unseen, uncontrollable power at work, which can neither be explained nor thwarted. And we understand that this this uncontrollable power at work is God. And as we read on in Esther 6, 4 through 13, I know this is a huge chunk, and I'm not going to read it all for you. I'm just going to, we're going to highlight as we walk through it. As we read on in Esther 6, 4 through 13, we see that the king wants to honor, he wants to honor Mordecai. We see in in verse 4, he calls out who is in the court, and Haman had just entered into the outer court of the king's palace to speak to the king about having Mordecai hanged on the gallows. Now, if there is a picture of irony in the Bible, this is it, right? Chapter 6 of Esther is irony in the Bible. Haman is in the court wanting to speak to the king about hanging Mordecai, the, uh, the king had just learned that he had not honored Mordecai for saving his life, and he's wanting to honor it. And he's, he's calling out, hey, who's in the court so I might talk to them about honoring Mordecai? And the young men, uh, the young men attending the king tell him that Haman is there standing in the court. And the king said, let him come in. And, and this is going to begin a series of reversals in the story of Esther. Now Haman, the king goes and he calls Haman in and he asks him about how the king should honor someone who delights in him. And, and Haman immediately thinks it's him, right? Because we know Haman, we talked a lot about it. Haman struggles with pride. If, if one thing that you could point to Haman and say, man, you need to work on that, it is pride. I mean, his pride was so big that he's wanting, because one person offended him, he's wanting to annihilate an entire race of people. That's how big his pride is. And so when when the king calls him in and says, hey, I've got somebody who who I want to honor because they have delighted me, Haman, Haman immediately thinks, who else, who else other than me? Who else other than me? I mean, honestly, a lot of times we live our life like that. We live our life believing our world is the center of the universe. Have you ever, have you ever driven down a road? When, when you're driving down a road, you're, you're thinking only about yourself, right? All right? Have you ever thought about, sat there and said, I'm going to think, what about the other people and their lives in, the, in those cars? It takes a conscious effort for us to think about that, right? That there are other people in the world living lives and, and they are thinking that they're the center of the world as well, right? We love our, our pride. We love our selfishness. And so Haman, when, when the king says, I got somebody to delight, he's like, man, that's me. I, who else could it be? I'm the bomb. It is the height of hubris, the height of pride in Haman. And it perfectly leads our way into our second point, that pride comes before the fall. We know this because Proverbs 16, 18 says pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before the fall. I mean, it's one of the most famous Proverbs, right? If only Haman had read it. If only Haman had read it, right? But we know he didn't, or he didn't live it out at least. And so we see the first reversal here, that instead of killing Mordecai, Haman is charged with honoring him. The king, the king, instead of saying, hey, this is, he walks through how he should be honored, right? Give him his robes, give him a king you've, uh, a horse you've ridden on, crown the horse, take him throughout the city, announce, hey, this is what, this is what you do if you delight the king, right? This is what you should do. And Haman's expecting it to be him expecting it to be him. And then right at the end, Xerxes says, all right, go do this 
for Mordecai the Jew. The guy that, that, that Haman had just come in that morning to ask for permission to kill on gallows. The guy that had, had set up this whole conflict. The guy that Haman had been in conflict for a while now. And so the first reversal we see that instead of killing Mordecai, Haman is charged with honoring him to wear a robe worn by the king, to to ride a horse with the highest mark of honor that could be shown uh, to a... was uh, was one of the highest marks of honor that could be shown to a subject. In fact, the royal robes was... The royal robes, there was was a... almost a sense of divinity in the royal robes. We learned that a lot of the kings like to, to claim divinity, Right? And so the royal robes, because they were only allowed to be worn by the king, that sense of, of divinity was, was almost imbued on them. And so to have somebody else wear the royal robes was, was incredibly, it was an incredible statement of the honor that was being bestowed on this person. Which is why Haman wanted it, right? Haman wanted that, but it was given to Mordecai. Now, I'll tell you this, I've read this story, I've read Esther several times, and and it never really occurred to me until I was studying Esther 6, the embarrassment and the blow to Haman's pride that this moment brought to Haman. You think about it, it, Haman has not been, he has been very vocal about his conflict with Mordecai. He's talked to his friends about it. He's talked to his wife. I'm sure he's talked to other people in the court about it. I mean, after all, he got a whole decree passed uh, because of it to annihilate the decree. I mean, so I'm sure he's talked to other people about it. And then we know, uh, we know that, that Mordecai's friends are aware of the conflict because Mordecai's friends are the ones that turned him into Haman for not bowing down to him. And so there was a lot of people that knew that there was conflict between Haman and Mordecai. And so the idea that Haman would be the one that would be charged with walking Mordecai the Jew around in royal robes on a royal horse that is crowned and declaring that this is what you do when you delight the king was an immense embarrassment to, to, to Haman, an immense blow to pride. Because as he's walking around the city square, as he's announcing this, there's got to be people that know the conflict that is between Haman and, and, and Mordecai. And they're seeing this take place, and it's got to be an immense embarrassment and blow to Haman's pride. But then at the end of it, we see that Mordecai returns back to the gate. And this is really important too, because because we seek, a lot of times we seek those honors. We seek the titles. We seek the promotions. We we seek the awards. In a lot of ways, we're, we're like Haman. In a lot of ways, we're like Haman. Because we seek the recognition. We, we want people to recognize our achievement. We want people to know how good we are. That we want people to look at us and say, man, you're, you're, you're really cool. You're really good. I want to be like you. But, but at the end of this, Mordecai, after he's honored... Given this honor, he's, he's allowed to wear the royal robes. He's, he's, he's riding the horse, which is the highest of honors you could do. At the end of it, nothing changes for Mordecai. He goes back to his station at the gate, right? He goes back to the king's gate. Nothing's changed. It's a, it, this, this little phrase where, or, at the end of it, Mordecai just goes back to the king's gate. It, it's a really telling thing for us. It's a really telling thing for us that, that the honor did not change his status. The honor did not somehow win him anything. The, the honor was fleeting. It's, it's not permanent. It doesn't have lasting value. And a lot of times we chase after these things in the world. We chase after the titles and the promotions and, and, and uh, 
and the good reputation and, 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 and people liking us, and, and that has no value. And I, I say that because, I mean, I've seen it in my own life. I've, I've done that. I, I've chased titles. I've chased promotions. I've, I've chased awards. But, I mean, everybody, everybody likes to be recognized for the work they do. Everybody likes to, and it, it, it's, a, it's a sense of pride, right? We take pride in our work. But, but we chase after the wrong thing. We chase after the wrong thing. Instead of, instead of chasing after the honors and, and the privileges of this world, we, we should be chasing after Jesus. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Don't abandon your first love. Go after God. We should be chasing after God and shit instead of chasing him. If anything, this shows, this shows the fact that Mordecai just goes back to the gate. It shows us that all the things in the world that we chase mean nothing. There is no value in them whatsoever. The only value that we have is in the relationship with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And that's what we should be chasing without abandon. We should be seeking that first. We should be sacrificing the honors of the world so that we might live a life that is honoring to Christ and chasing after our relationship with Jesus. I'm going to say that again because it is totally opposed to what the world says. We should be chasing Christ instead of chasing the honors of the world. We should be sacrificing the things of the world at the feet of Jesus because we want to be close and near to him. Because in the end, they don't mean anything. And Haman, Haman, at the end of this, he rushes back home in distress, covering his head in grief. And, and, and this, that phrase, covering his head in grief, man, he was humiliated. It was a humiliation for him. That morning he had gone in at the height of hubris, thinking that he is the best in the kingdom, that the king wants to honor him, that he's going to get to kill Mordecai finally. He had built his gallows. He was ready to kill Mordecai. And instead, he is humiliated by, may, by, by being made to honor the person he is, he is going to kill, he was wanting to kill. And his wife and friends, when, when they hear about this, he goes, goes home and he tells them about what happens that his wife and friends, who we know already give him bad advice, they recognize it, and they, they recognize this reversal that has happened right off the bat. And they, they just one day before, they had suggested to Haman to build the gallows and, 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 and kill, go and kill Mordecai. They recognize the signs that this reversal is just the beginning. In, in verse 13, They say to him, if Mordecai, before whom you have begun to fall, is the Jewish people, you will not overcome him, but will surely fall before him. They recognize the reversal. They recognize that, 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 that God has changed the order of things. And in verse 14, we see that... that while they are yet talking to him, the king's eunuchs arrived and hurried to bring Haman to the feast that Esther had prepared. Throughout the book of Esther, the author uses these feasts or banquets to move through important and significant events. There's eight, eight feasts or banquets that we see throughout Esther. And, and each one of these is, is around important and significant events. You know, the first one was to gather support for, for Xerxes' war that he was wanting to wage against Greek. The second one was the dismissal of Queen Vashti. The third was 
The, the third was uh, the coronation of Esther. The fourth we read in, 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 in chapter 6, and, and we see that this banquet was to set up to allow God time, not to allow God time, but, but to demonstrate patience, Esther's patience, for God's timing to work. And, and we're going to walk into the next feast in, 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 in verse 7, and it's, in a, it's setting, or I mean in chapter 7, and, and it's setting the stage for another significant event, another big, bigger reversal that is going to happen. And the, the reversals that began with God in a sleepless night, not Esther, it's, it's important for us to realize that this, the reversals don't begin with Esther. They don't begin with Esther's confrontation with Haman or going to, or going to the king to talk to him, right? The, the reversal has already happened at that point. It began with God and a sleepless night. Even, even his wife and his friends recognize that the reversal has already happened before Esther mentions it to the king. And in her, in her patience, in Esther's patience, God worked. Like Psalm 120 said, it was in Esther's sleep that God literally moved. It is in Esther's sleep like she, after the banquet, she went and went, went to sleep. God gave her rest and took rest from her husband so that he might be able to move, right? So that his work would be accomplished, so that he would be, that he would move things. In the night causing a, uh, in the night causing a sleepless night that began the reversals, that, that God literally moved and began the reversals in, in the sleepless night. Night of the King. Point three this morning, if you're taking notes, is that the reversal scene in Esther is a foreshadowing of a great, re greater reversal. The pivot points and reversals in the book of Esther mirrors on a small scale the structure of all redemptive history. Because of our sin, we're not living in the Garden of Eden, right? Because of the fall, we're not living in the Garden of Eden we're with God where he would walk and talk with us in the coolness of the day, right? We're missing out on that because of sin. Rather, we live in the exile of history, in a world where God is unseen, And God has pronounced a sentence of death on us, on the world, and every evidence of human circumstance demonstrates its efficacy. We should and do expect nothing but death. If there is one thing in this world that I, I can be sure about is that we are all going to die short of the rapture. Every single person in this room, from, from little child to grown adult, we're all going to die. It is this pronouncement of judgment on us because of sin that we can be sure of one thing. Death is coming for us. Every day, every minute we live, death is getting closer. In fact, we don't know. We might live to 80. We might live to 100. We might live to 30. We don't know when that is going to occur. Only God does. In his perfect timing, in his perfect providence, you will never die earlier or later than you should. You're going to die in... in God's perfect timing in his providence. It's a sure thing. But the ultimate reversal happens in another seemingly ordinary human event. The birth of a baby in Bethlehem. And then the future execution of that man on the cross. Because of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, our destiny has been reversed from death 
to life against all expectations. So like Esther, in the story of Esther, where where God uses a seemingly insignificant event to to begin the reversal that will eventually, as we see as we walk through Esther, that will eventually save the Israelites, save the Jewish people from annihilation, and in fact deliver their enemies into their hands. This is on a small scale of what we see in redemptive history, the arc of redemptive history, where a small insignificant event, which ends up to us, which ends up to be the greatest event in history, the birth of a tiny baby in Bethlehem named Jesus Christ and his future execution on a cross brings salvation and redemption to us and into the entire world. It is the destruction of death. It is the greater reversal of all of history. In a commentary, I read that the cross of Jesus Christ is the pivot point of the the great reversal of history, where where our sorrow has been turned to joy. And as the Apostle Paul writes in his book to the Romans, uh, in Romans 8, 35 through 39, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or, or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. The commentary goes on to say, in in our darkest hours, we can be assured of our final destiny and glory with Christ. We can be assured that the reversal of circumstances we so crave will will one day be ours. By contrast, no matter how prosperous or powerful, those who are not in Christ will ultimately also suffer a reversal of fortune. Like Haman, they will find themselves caught in a web of destruction that hindsight will show to be of their own making, and it can, only, and it can happen at any time. Those who are in Christ glory and rejoice in the destruction of death that will eventually come, that is promised because of his death and resurrection his death on the cross and resurrection. Those who are not in Christ, their only promise is death. And so I, I would plead to you, if you're, if you're here today and you've never made a decision to, to follow Jesus, today is the day. There's one thing in life that's guaranteed, and that is that you're going to die. But where are you going to go? Who are you going to be with when that happens? Are you going to be with Jesus Christ who promises eternal life? Or are you going to be condemned? Because there's only two options. Despite what you might have heard, there are only two, do- two options. Repent and be saved or stand condemned. And man, if you haven't made that decision today, I, I would say, man, it is, it is your day to make that decision. It is your day to make that decision. I want to close today by looking at God's providence in our own lives. At the wedding this weekend, um, I love to talk about in the in the wedding and and uh, the service for the wedding. I love to talk about all the events that led up to them getting together. 
um, and, and show and, and just have them think about how, how their entire lives, all, all of their lives have led to this moment where they're standing making a covenant before God, joining in marriage. And all the things that, that, that led them to, all the moments and all the things that have led to that moment. And I remember I, uh, I, hadn't, um, I hadn't discussed it with them before. Um, I, I normally don't, <laughs> what, what I'm going to say in the service. But um, the, I remember the, the bride coming up to me, uh, Liz coming up to me and, and saying that, man, she really appreciated that. Because over the last two weeks, the Lord had been showing her how they, they had often... Uh, uh, they had often complained, or not complained, but um, felt sorrow because because they were they were older in age, felt sorrow that they would not that they had not met earlier, and they would not have as much time as as many of you might be enjoying thirty, forty, fifty years. I mean, they were seventy three and sixty getting married, and so you know there's only a certain amount of days that that were promised. And so there was sorrow, and, and they were thinking about that. But, but in thinking of that, the Lord had showed them that it, when they looked at their life, when they took an inventory of their life, that all of the things that, that led them to that, if they had met earlier, they wouldn't have gotten along. The Lord needed to work out things in their life, to, uh, like uh, anger issues and, and, and self-reliance issues and other, other things. They needed to, God needed to iron out those things before they met so that, so that when they met, they, they, could, they could stand before God and make this covenant. Because if they had met earlier in life, it wouldn't have worked. Previously in, in, in Israel's history, God, God has used mighty miracles to deliver his people and fulfill his promises. And, and the, Esther, the story of Esther, God was using ordinary events of life to realize his covenant promise to his people. Even using, some, uh, even using significant, seemingly insignificant events like a sleepless night to change the course of history. Isn't it amazing that our God is so great, so powerful, that he can work without miracles? Through the ordinary events of billions of humans, human lives, through millennia of time, to accomplish his eternal purposes. And if you take the time to look over your life, you might come to realize that, that oftentimes it is when you have laid before God and rested and allowed to God to work, that's when things have actually moved in your life when you have been patient and had faith in God. And all of, all of those events, all of the events in your life have led you here this morning. All of those events in your life, maybe if you're already a believer, all of those, those events in your life led you to Christ. All of the things that you went through, all of the things that you might have suffered, all of, all of the things that you might have endured, all of the things, the joyous things, all of those things led you to your relationship with Christ. All of those things led you here this morning. And I'm going to say it again. All of those things have led you here this morning that if you have not received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, it's time to do that. Because if there's one thing true, is that we need Jesus. We need Jesus. Let's pray.